Hello. Our story begins on Corellia as two Jedi explore the wreckage of a prosperous ship builder on the eastern quadrant of the city. Obi-Wan and Anakin were brought here to find an engineer. He had blueprints for a new ship of the line for passenger vessels. They'd be made cheaper and more cost effective for Republic hyperspace lane businesses and passengers. The engineer had a lot of business rivals, but because he worked on the ships himself, he had no interest in the business side of things. The corporate heads wanted him dead because he'd be pulling credits from their bank accounts by making the vessels more affordable to the public. It wouldn't have been an issue for them if he didn't publicly disclose his discoveries. The Jedi were here to find him and hopefully get him to a safe location. Apparently, he boarded a starship with a couple of his colleagues, and the ship crashed down in the industrial sector of the Corellian city. Anakin landed the Jedi shuttle and the two Jedi walked out, looking around the area as Obi-Wan took point. He told Anakin to keep an eye out. Anakin asked why, and Kenobi informed him that the industrial sector workers of this town had a habit of not being too kind to Jedi. All he reminded Anakin is that they were here for recovery. There would be no reason for them to get into hostilities with the locals. Anakin rolled his eyes and they walked forward. They already did their debriefing and they were simply searching for the coordinates of the engineer's shuttle. The man had a friend who was going to use his political sway to get the corporations in Corellia to use his blueprints. But the corporate heads of other galactic-sized corporations got to the engineer before we could deliver the data chips to the shipbuilders guild on Kuat. The entire situation was just a mess. As Obi-Wan and Anakin came up to the wreckage, Kenobi told Anakin to look around the vicinity and see if he could find any potential dangers or survivors of the wreck. Obi-Wan was analyzing the back of the ship. There were blaster holes on the back of the vessel, depicting that there had been an altercation in the air. Obi-Wan then heard a voice of an injured man. He came around the corner and looked into a hole in the ship. The entire crew was wounded or killed. Obi-Wan looked at them and asked them if they were alright. The man was struggling to get out any words, but he couldn't articulate anything. Kenobi peeked in and started walking forward when a bomb went off, throwing Obi-Wan out of the ship and Anakin into a pillar, knocking him unconscious. Everyone inside the vessel was killed immediately. When Anakin came to, he looked over and could see a squad of mercenaries moving through the wreckage field. They were searching for the blueprints, but they weren't inside the ship to begin with. Aside from the engineers, all the information they needed had been transported on another vessel and was already off-world. Skywalker could see everything happening and tapped his comm link on his wrist, one that transmitted an SOS to the Jedi on Coruscant. He then used a pillar to pull himself off the ground. He was very weak, and it felt like he busted a rib or two. Anakin peered around the corner and listened to the mercenaries, as they told the person in the hologram that there were no survivors, and the explosion killed two Jedi Knights. Anakin's heart sank into his stomach. He could see that Obi-Wan was on the ground and wasn't moving. They must have diagnosed that he was dead, but they were wrong about himself, so for a moment, Anakin could breathe. He snuck around. His main objective was getting his injured master out of harm's way. The mercenaries hadn't noticed that he was up and on the move. Plus, they were being instructed to scour the wreckage again. Another dropship landed and more mercenaries leapt out to accompany the search. Skywalker pulled Obi-Wan's body to the side, into the shadows. He looked down and could feel his master's cold skin. It wasn't right. And then when he went searching for a pulse, there was none to be found. Anakin's hands trembled, and then everything went red. His lightsaber ignited as he pulled Obi-Wan's off of his belt. He rolled around the corner and swung forward. Anakin wouldn't remember a second of his atrocities. His lightsaber sped through the mercenaries as he slashed them down. They initially were surprised one of the Jedi survived, but what they didn't expect was his aggression. Anakin didn't just kill them, he ripped them apart. Some of them lost hands and feet, others lost legs and arms. The rest were decapitated and simply cut down. Anakin went all out in his massacre of the people who killed his master. During his blind rage, he lost all focus and passed out. When he woke up, Master Balaba was walking around the wreckage and examining everything. Her former teacher was also with her. In a similar fashion to Obi-Wan and Anakin, Depa was looking around the area as Mace went to check on the two Jedi present. Anakin was sitting below Obi-Wan and his head was laid back against a collection of pipes. Mace checked on them and realized that Obi-Wan had likely died in Anakin's arms. However, what happened to the mercenaries? They were killed by lightsaber, and Obi-Wan's injuries didn't depict that of a Jedi being slain by blaster. Not to mention both lightsabers were lying near Anakin's hands. Everything would be taken back to the temple. The corporate heads who were responsible were brought to jail for their crimes and subsequently jailed for life. The people who died were memorialized for their achievements in engineering, and the Jedi returned to Coruscant to handle their own situation. Master Kenobi was dead, and Anakin Skywalker massacred the people responsible for his death. But it wouldn't be until Anakin woke up that they would get his perspective of things. Due to Mace flying, it would be Master Balaba that would comfort Anakin when he woke up. He still didn't register that Obi-Wan was gone, and he had no memories of the atrocities he committed on Corellia. Depa wouldn't gain anything from him waking up, 
and she would inform Mace after Skywalker went back to sleep. In less than 24 hours, Anakin would learn that he had broken a couple ribs and bruised an organ. He then would be there for Obi-Wan when his body was buried inside the Jedi Temple. It was the literal worst day of his life, and he couldn't really understand why this happened. He also didn't know what would happen. Because Anakin blacked out in Corellia, he couldn't tell the Council what happened. He didn't know. They didn't believe he was responsible, but they also couldn't just deny that something had happened with lightsabers. But Anakin did reveal the ship exploded and he and Obi-Wan were thrown from the wreckage. So the Council could deduce that either Anakin killed all those mercenaries, or Obi-Wan did. But the way they were killed was unlike Obi-Wan, so they assumed it was Anakin who did it. But without concrete evidence, they couldn't just blame him for it, and they wouldn't. Instead, they'd have more important things to talk about, like who would finish Anakin's training. As they began the discussions, Anakin was requested to the Executive Building, where he would once again interact with the Supreme Chancellor. Palpatine was at the funeral for Obi-Wan. He said he was there because he knew how much Kenobi meant to young Skywalker. Anakin appreciated this and saw this as a highly respectable thing for Palpatine to do. It showed that he genuinely cared for Anakin. During their conversation, the Chancellor would disclose the secrets of Darth Plagueis the Wise. His intention wasn't to immediately pull Skywalker into the dark side of the Force. Rather, he wanted the darkness to be present. He wanted Anakin to have the Sith on his mind. Because Sidious knew that once he placed a thought, then Skywalker's mind would do the work. Essentially, all he needed to do was tell Anakin that the Sith learned how to stop people from dying. And then, from there, the eager mind of the young Jedi would begin exploring other potential scenarios. Powers that the Jedi had never flaunted. The Sith showed their power and Skywalker didn't realize that's where the lie started. Being a Sith would rip him apart. But at this point, the tragedy of a once great Sith Lord allowed Anakin to consider different paths in his future. He expressed gratitude to Palpatine for taking him under his wing and giving him the time of day. It was appreciated more than Anakin could verbally say. Skywalker returned to the temple with an outlook different than the one he had before he left. The promises of the Sith were alluring, but they never kept all those promises. The life of a Sith was suffering so that one could achieve absolute power. Skywalker had little understanding of what that was at the moment. When he returned, he was grabbed by Depa Balaba, who brought him to the Jedi High Council. He thought he was in trouble, but again, without any evidence, they couldn't just blame him for something they weren't entirely sure he did or not. Plus, they were willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, simply due to how awkward the situation was. Anyways, Depa explained to him on the way up to the Council Chambers that they had selected him a brand new Jedi Master. Honestly, Anakin just assumed they would throw him to the side and forget about him, but the Council was very adamant that he be trained by someone within their ranks. He was being put under the guidance of Plo Koon, a Jedi who was currently still training a student. Plo's ascension to the High Council was one that came early in his career as a Jedi, but it also came with the death of his former master, Councilmember Taivoka, in 44 BBY. Plo was a Jedi Knight when his master died, and was brought to the Council per his master's dying wishes. Plo hadn't trained a student by the time he joined the Council, and now he was. Ulter Swan was close to Anakin's age, and Plo suggested to the Council that he take on Skywalker as a student because of that. He didn't believe it would be easy, but Plo's reasoning is that having another student to train with, or someone his own age to be around, would be pleasant as an experience for him. Plus, Voltor was more Jedi-like of an individual, so she could be the younger side of guidance that Anakin needed. The Council was unsure if they wanted Plo to be in charge of both Swan and Skywalker, but his track record was impressive thus far as a Jedi. The Council already knew that Tyvoka's trust in his student had been proven correct. Plo was one of the most exceptional Jedi on the Council. If anyone could handle the instruction of two Jedi, then it would be him. However, this entire ordeal wouldn't go without the eyes of the Council itself. They believed that they needed to be on top of everything Skywalker did under Plo's instruction. All of these extra details were never mentioned when it was announced to Skywalker, who his new master was. Plo knew he'd be under the eyes of his colleagues, so he prepared a number of ways to record and track Skywalker's growth as an individual throughout this journey. Anakin was genuinely surprised the Council was willing to take care of him, but the ordeal surrounding the death of his master was already difficult. No need to complicate things for the young Jedi. Yoda was very watchful over the situation. He wanted to be sure Skywalker would handle the adversity properly, but there was never any telling with Skywalker. They would just have to trust Plo's skills as an instructor. If he could succeed, it'd be better for the Jedi as a whole. If not, then the Council would have to step in. First thing was first, though. Plo had to introduce Anakin the Boltar. She was a year and a half older than him. She was very much so a Jedi to her core, and unlike him, she was at the top of her classes when it came to scores. Anakin definitely had a higher ceiling, but she was closing in on her own ceiling earlier, simply due to how seriously she took her training. She obviously had her own unique personality, but it meshed with Plo extremely well, which made her even more his student. Anakin didn't feel at odds when he was introduced to Boltar. She was kind, collected, and compassionate towards him. 
As the training began with his new student, Flo realized that he was having struggles with keeping Skywalker focused. He was always distracted like a fly on the wall, his eyes on a hundred different directions. He couldn't sit still to save his life, and it didn't exactly make the situation any easier on Plo. He had patience, but Anakin's distaste for the Jedi way made the entire ordeal more difficult for him to manage. He didn't know how to just get Anakin to calm down. It was like Anakin's heart was elsewhere. Plo did a similar start to every day. He and Boltar would do a meditation in a number of places, sometimes even down by Mount Umate in the plaza. It was just simply a way to connect themselves to the Force so they could be ready for the day. Once that was finished, there would be basic instruction inside the archives and then the training. Skywalker hated this more than anything, because the training wasn't done with lightsabers. Boltar and Plo were both exceptional in the martial arts of the Jedi way, or in other words, self-defense without the sword. The forms used by Plo and Boltar were Kido, Udo, and Ravaga. Many of these were adopted centuries before the Jedi ever came to Coruscant. But the two Jedi practiced them daily, because for Plo, he believed that a Jedi shouldn't go directly to the blade. If they can defend themselves and others without it, then it would make them more efficient peacekeepers. Skywalker struggled with this, especially because Plo and Boltar, aside from being talented with the blade, didn't practice with it as much as one might think. He desperately wanted to use his weapon, but the other two discouraged it. Plo usually ran a tight ship with Boltar, but when he took on Skywalker, he loosened the reins for the first two weeks. The reason for this is he wanted Swan and Skywalker to get acquainted with each other before the real training began. This play was a brilliant one, because Anakin needed someone his own age to be a friend with. He wasn't unpopular, but he just didn't get along with many other students of his own age. So having Boltar be his first real friend, aside from maybe Barris, who was a year younger than him, was nice. He really appreciated the camaraderie he got from interacting with her. She was obviously a bit more Jedi than he was, but he could handle it because, like Plo, she was open-minded and willing to see things from his perspective, and even willing to question him about his thoughts. This led the two students to going out on adventures after they finished training with Plo. There were safe spots around the city, and Jedi Padawans were permitted to leave the temple between 5pm and 10pm. Younglings had a much shorter leash, but it was a way for younger Jedi to get acquainted with the city they lived in. There are marked off locations for these Jedi. So they could go to the plaza, but they couldn't go to Zero the Hut's club on the far side of town. Basic rules, nothing too difficult to comprehend. So Anakin and Boltar went to the plaza a couple of times. It was during the season where carnivals were being held, so rides, delicacies, entertainment, and so forth were out and about. It was nice for the two of them to connect with one another. Anakin really needed this, and he was grateful for her friendship, but also the instruction of Plo. However, this didn't mean that everything was perfect for Skywalker. He did like Plo, but his teaching methods were difficult for him to be compatible with. On top of that, the pull of the dark side was stronger than ever before. It would only get stronger as the days to weeks to months continued by. Plo, after about two months of making no progress with Skywalker, shifted his teaching habits. Everything he did was correct, but Plo was unaware that he was also competing with the Dark Lord of the Sith. He was very aware of the dynamic between Palpatine and Skywalker, and he allowed it to continue, especially in a time like this. He knew it would be improper to pull Skywalker away from his friend after losing his master, so he didn't do that. Instead, he let Anakin go whenever he needed to go. Anakin was now being pulled back and forth because he was telling Palpatine about every instruction that Plo was doing, telling Palpatine everything he liked and disliked. This made everything even more difficult for Plo because it meant that Palpatine had ammo. He would tell Anakin about how much easier it'd be if something was done a little differently, of course expressing that as a politician he couldn't speak on behalf of the Force or laser swords, but he did speak his mind on what he knew and understood about people. Palpatine continued to add friction to the dynamic and relationship between Plo and Anakin, but the dynamic between Skywalker and Swan only continued further. They got each other in a way, but the relationship was still forming. They were becoming great friends with each other, and it was truthfully because Plo allowed them to have so much time around each other without his supervision. But because of Palpatine's interference, Plo changed his teaching styles once again to try and accommodate for Anakin. It was difficult, and even stressful on the Jedi instructor. Plo didn't want to fail either student, and he could see that every time he changed his teaching style to help Anakin, it hurt Swan. It then resulted in a course correction to ensure that both students were getting the best from the situation. Plo knew he could do it, and he spent a number of days meditating on it to try and find the answer he was looking for. When he came around to the conclusion, he realized that what he needed to do was keep Anakin away from the Chancellor, but also allow him to have more freedom on Coruscant. Plo couldn't find any reasoning or rationale behind the conflicting thoughts or ideas that Anakin kept on having, and the only time Anakin became a lot more feisty, for lack of a better word, was whenever he came back from the Chancellor's office. 
Ultar also reinforced this by telling Plo that Anakin noted a couple specifics from the Chancellor, nothing about the Dark Side or Plagueis but his ideals. The irony is, despite Boltar being raised inside the Jedi Temple and being a true Jedi, she could see some of the points being made by the Chancellor, but these were all through the lens of deception. Of course they'd sound better on paper. Palpatine was pulling the strings and he could tell that there was an interest or at least a possible interest from Swan's perspective. Their turn to the dark side would be easy and he knew exactly how to orchestrate the situation. As Chancellor, he requests for two Jedi to complete a mission for him. Because of the changes made the Plo's regiment in training, he could play off of that and see if the Jedi instructor would allow his students to go on a mission alone. From there, he would seduce them to the dark side, let them become his pupils, and then he'd have two apprentices for the future. It was brilliant. He was so glad that Kenobi died on Corellia. It would make everything move faster for his personal plans. It was a rescue mission for Masameda. The Jedi needed to go save him. He wasn't actually captured. Palpatine suggested Anakin and his good friend be the ones to go. The Jedi did not like this idea, but the only reason they agreed to it is because it would be beneficial for their training and they'd be seen as lesser threats. Palpatine insinuated that the Padawans could go down there undetected because they were young. On top of that, Palpatine believed Moss would be killed if they saw Jedi Masters down there. It would be safer for everyone involved with the situation if Skywalker and Swan went. The Jedi present reluctantly agreed and then insinuated that Plo be the one to inform his students, which is what he did. Anakin and Boltor were very excited to have their own solo mission. Plo was eager for them, but a part of him was also very concerned. He didn't want anything bad happening to them. The mission, therefore, was approved and the two young Jedi descended into the lower levels of Coruscant. The planet was much different below the surface. It was dark, disgusting, filled with death, and the last place anyone from the top side of the planet wanted to be. The Jedi came down here frequently. They were at least trying to help the situation. It was just hard. Coruscant had four quadrillion sentience on it, and they didn't have the resources to take care of all of Coruscant or the galaxy. Both Jedi had been down here before, but it was unnerving for both of them. Anakin had memories of when he and Obi-Wan came down here. It was the first time he really acknowledged within himself how much his master meant to him. He didn't have the whereabouts to understand that Obi-Wan meant so much to him. Now that he was gone, Skywalker found being down here as a way to remember his former instructor and do right by him. He had come to terms with the loss, mostly through his friendship and his new master, but there were still parts of Kenobi's death that irked Skywalker, like the fact that he didn't get to kill the man who hired the mercenaries. Regardless, the two Jedi landed in their unidentified craft and carried on through the streets of the city. They were given the coordinates and made their way there. When they arrived, they found the building to be abandoned, but it was swirling with the dark side of the forest. There was something truly evil about this occasion. They didn't know what it was, though. As they searched the building for Masameda, a blue flame ignited, and then another, and following that, several more. Anakin and Boltar ignited their weapons and stood back to back, searching for the dark entity, but there was none. Instead, there was an altar. The two of them walked up to it and looked over in it. They hadn't seen anything like this before. There was never anything in their training to prepare them for this. Anakin deignited his weapon first and walked up to it. He felt around and then he saw that there was water in it. When he reached down to feel it, on the way down, he slid his finger and blood fell into the small pool. He pulled back and Bolter ran over and looked into the pool, noticing filling with the red from Anakin's blood. She then asked what was happening, and he told her to be careful. Sidi so sat in the corner of the room with an evil grin. He waited for her to make the same error. She did, looking into the pool and cutting her wrist on the edge of the altar having it carved into the side of it. Both of them were so confused, and then it all became dark. There was no light, and they reached for each other. As soon as their hands touched, everything became still. They'd wake up days later in a Sith lair on level 1030. They had no clue where they were, but something about them felt different. It was the same feelings of rebellion and a mix of darkness that was so familiar, but now it was amplified. Sidious used an old Sith curse to push them further into the dark side. Both of their eyes were yellow, and they could feel the true power of the dark side. Ultra noticed immediately. She pulled Anakin's face as she examined his eyes, telling him that they were yellow. He said the same about her eyes. She asked where they were, and he looked around, not recognizing anything about their current landscape. They both got up and looked around. Having their blood was essential for the curse to work, and Sidious knew that they would fall for the trap. They found another altar. But this one was different. It looked like it was thousands of years old, but carved into the sides were their names. Out from the shadows came a Sith Lord, one with a mask and deathly colored eyes. He told them that their journey was complete. They both pulled their lightsabers and found them to be red, as if they had already joined the dark side. The man smiled under his mask and told them that they were in service of a greater cause, one that would gift them true power, one that would allow them to be the greatest Sith the galaxy had ever seen. Because both Skywalker and Swan had their own rebellious feelings towards the Jedi amplified, they saw this as a potential path to follow. 
Out from the shadows, an elegant upper-class voice told them that to leave the Jedi Order was the first part, to commit to the dark side was the pleasure. From the other side of the room, another voice told them that what they wanted could be theirs. Because both Anakin and Bolter were young, they couldn't keep up with the Sith masterminds. Cities had been planning this for months, ever since Kenobi's death. He would ensure the Jedi fell to the dark side. This ritual continued, pulling at the young Jedi and pulling their minds back and forth. Because at the end of it all, they both understood that something was wrong here, but they were too foggy in the head to notice or tell what it was. As the voices continued, the masked man disappeared, and they were left with nothing but the voices that echoed around them. They couldn't see Dooku or Sidious, until the Dark Lord of the Sith presented himself and told them to kneel. Skywalker and Swan fell over, not even by their own accord. Sidious informed them that their turn would be one of magnificence and one of triumph for the Sith. They must be ready for what they were going to become. One by one, Anakin and Boltar passed out. Sidious turned to his student and gave him the next layer of instructions. All the while, Palpatine returned to playing the confused and worried politician. Thankfully, Plo and Windu were able to save Masameda, but the missing Padawans were of concern. As Bolter and Anakin were being transported across the galaxy, they both had interweaving visions, ones that related to the same point, the dark side was more powerful than the light. Alongside this deception, their memories were being twisted. Sidious and Dooku were doing everything in their power to make sure that when the Padawans woke up, they were completely subservient to the dark side. They were brought to Moribon and left there with Dooku until Sidious' arrival. At the moment, he was making sure the Jedi fell victim to his plot. They were desperately trying to find the lost students and they were having very little luck. Plo took this loss heavily, but he knew that he couldn't give in to his emotions. He trained them both well, and Kenobi had done a sound job with Skywalker thus far. The Padawans would find their way home. He held a deep belief that they would. On Moribon, Skywalker and Swan woke up next to each other. There was no sign of life and they didn't see any vessels, just alone in front of a temple. There was a sandstorm coming towards them and they grabbed each other and ran for the Sith temple. They didn't know what it was, but similarly to the lair on Coruscant, it was lit with blue flames. Skywalker and Swan spoke to each other, both acknowledging something had happened to them. They didn't know what. As they continued forward, they found another altar and steered clear. Dooku showed himself and then informed them that they were safe from the Jedi. They'd been hunting them down, trying to kill them. That didn't make any sense, and honestly, it didn't need to. All that mattered was that the two students believed it, and they bought the bait. This was entirely influenced through their changed memories. When Sidious arrived later that night, he'd bring them food and supplies and then inform them that he brought them to his lair to save them. The Jedi were trying to strip them of their control of the Force. Anakin and Bolter didn't understand, but the voice of Palpatine was calm and hypnotic. Every word he said slipped into their brains like a disease, and it fed off their weaknesses. The Jedi Way never prepared these Padawans for this, and Palpatine enacted his plans of darkness, and then left Dooku on the planet to train them. But because he knew of what worked with Skywalker and what didn't, he focused on having Dooku do exactly what worked with him, though some of these things didn't work for Swan, which put her off. These teachings and instructions went on for the longer part of a year. The Jedi had pretty much given up hope that they would never find the Padawans again, and Plo took the blame upon himself for failing Skywalker and Swan. He would step down from the council, letting go of his lifetime seat that his former master gave him, and then taking a bearish vow, which led to him completely abandoning the Jedi Order to try and find peace within himself. It was a hard time for him as an instructor, but the council honored his wishes as he left the order. On Moraban, Anakin and Bolter continued to rise on the dark side, but something happened within Swan. As she fell behind Anakin, due to the focus on the teaching style that benefited Skywalker more than her, she reflected. She realized that her emotions were not matching up with her memories. The Sith had done a fine job with keeping the two former students loyal to their cause. This was through non-stop work. The two Jedi never stopped training torturing themselves or forcing themselves further into the darkness, so they never had time to actually go into their memories and try and understand them. Swan noticed something specific. In her training as a Sith, she found disfavor towards the Jedi, which meant she also had disfavor towards Anakin when he was a Jedi, but that didn't make sense. She knew that at one point or another she had a secret crush on him for a couple months leading up to their disappearance. When she realized something was wrong, she knew that there had to be a reason for it. She continued digging through her mind and using her meditative state to break free from her chains. She found that there was more to the puzzle, and then she realized something else. The altar here was the same one at the first and second layer. It had been the key to everything, but she couldn't just destroy it. The chain reaction alone would probably kill both her and Anakin. However, that was probably a better fate than becoming tools for the dark side. She and Skywalker became extremely powerful in their age. It was the work of the dark side, and Swan knew she had come to a decision. If she didn't, then she'd be sacrificing the future of not just herself, but her friend, and all of her friends inside the Jedi Order. 
She had to try. The focus on Skywalker already told her enough. He was what they wanted, and she would at one point or another become expendable to them. So she waited. She started collecting details, memories, moments, anything she could to try and help Anakin once the time came for them to try and become members of the light side again. And then, the Sith Lord arrived. Sidious did every other month check-ins, and he was stopping by to see the progress. It was coming along soundly, and Sidious was excited. He wanted to see them in action. A spar would take place, and then a show of strength. It was just as every other encounter with him went, and then it would end with them at the very altar that held their curse. This time though, as Sidious opened it up and began his enchantment with Dooku by his side, Swan jumped up, using the force to throw Anakin backwards as she thrust her lightsaber into the altar and slashed across. The move caught everyone off guard, but instead of an explosion, nothing happened. Swan looked at it confused, and then up to Sidious who was using the force to keep everything, every single particle in place. Nothing would destroy him. He told her that she would pay for her lack of vision. She looked up at him and she tried to do anything, but she couldn't. He stopped her with the force. She could no longer move. He expressed that she was too weak to be a Sith as it was. This ritual would have been her final one, so she was just making the time pass faster. Sidious turned to Dooku and instructed him on how to end the ritual so they wouldn't die. As she was frozen in place, she used all of her dark side strength, which wasn't much in the light of Dooku or Sidious, but enough to get what she wanted done. She dispersed a little bit of liquid from the altar outwards and it burnt through the skin of both Dooku and Sidious. It was enough to jar their concentration that Swan was able to drive her lightsaber into Sidious' knee and he dropped his grip. The ground erupted in front of her and she used all of her footing to launch herself into the air. An explosion sounded off and eradicated the two Sith on impact. Skywalker was thrown to the side of the temple and Swan to the other. When she woke up, she's being carried out of the rubble by Anakin and he dropped her outside the temple, both of them tumbling over being released from the dark side curse for the first time in forever. It would feel like eons, but they would use Palpatine's vessel to contact the temple and get reinforcements to them. When they came, they were ushered back home and the Jedi took care of them. They had been corrupted very badly, but the light would always persevere. Despite the nature of a bearish vow, the council informed Plo of what happened and he rushed home. The council would use the force to kill the virus infecting the young Jedi. They had survived by a miracle. Swan was barely alive and she was almost killed in the blast. If it wasn't for her jumping up, she would have been incinerated. Skywalker carried her out of the temple before it fell in on itself. They would recover at separate times, Anakin being first because his injuries weren't nearly as bad. And then after, Bolter would recover. Due to the incineration of Palpatine, no one knew what happened to him. He just vanished. The two Padawans didn't know he was an evil Sith Lord. They just knew there was a Sidious and Tyrannus, both of which were dead. Anakin felt terrible about everything, and he had a dreadful hate for the dark side, but he couldn't hate it. That would lead him right back down the dark path. Instead, he became grateful for it, because without it, he couldn't be who he was now, or who he was becoming. Of course, he wouldn't want to go through what he went through again, but on the other side of things, he was glad he did. not Without it, he wouldn't ever understand the importance of the Jedi way like he did now. While the Sith were gone, their plans weren't. The Senate was still in need of a desperate fixing, and it wouldn't ever come to the extent it was needed, but it would never devolve into a war. The Jedi wouldn't ever have to fight for the galaxy because all that would happen is a massive government shutdown and realization of how to fix it, none of it being automatic, but more so the perpetuation of a cycle that existed in Republic politics, a loop that they hoped could be resolved one day. Without Dooku, the Separatists would never have the courage or strength to unite, let alone stand against the Republic. The clones would never be discovered, and the Kaminoans would reach out and be met with confusion. As for Anakin and Boltar, they would continue being close friends, Swan never admitting her feelings for Anakin and allowing the crush she had on him to slip away. Skywalker actually developed a crush on her, but before anything ever happened, it slipped away as well. He never ended up developing one again for Padme after what he had for Swan. Anakin therefore learned to lessen his desire for action, adventure, and find the horizon. Instead. He listened to Plo as he and Bolter finished their Padawan training and became Jedi Knight themselves. Plo would eventually rejoin the High Council, and by the time he did, Anakin was finishing up Ahsoka's training. Swan, on the other hand, continued down the path she desired and eventually became a teacher for younglings, which is what she had always wanted to be. The Jedi Order would continue forward, with the Sith gone and no one ever discovering Maul, the future of the galaxy was bright and free from the evil stench of the Sith. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Jango Fett clone, Ben Ingram, the Big Red Piermark, 
Diamond Constant, Darth Nemesis, Galvin Gaming, Tristan Mandalore, Sir William 1767, Darth Revan, Grandity Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Cullen Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Weebo 670, Annika Shank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tam, Johnny Daguin, Sith Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Cali, Gunlin 66 Mammoth Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Forest League Lake Star Wars, Airbus, Wax Wolf, Matthew First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Luke Denwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button if you support me otherwise. Go check out the Patreon. Really cool things on there, early access, other cool things like that. Otherwise, let's talk about the story. The idea of Obi-Wan dying during Anakin's training feels like it should offset everything, and it does. And I wanted to focus on how the Jedi and Sith would respectively act in the situation. And I wanted the tug of war to feel really present. I didn't want the Jedi to just jump on it because they wouldn't, and I wanted Palpatine to take full advantage of it, which is why they fall to the dark side. I think Palpatine just didn't anticipate another Jedi being involved. It was also cool to give Balter Swan a spotlight, because she was in Attack of the Clones and then never seen afterward. And while the story is an overwhelmingly positive ending, the Republic doesn't actually get fixed. It's still like the Republic stays the same consistently from where it was, just without the Sith or Palpatine. So there's no war, it just remains corrupt and continues going that way. So. I hope you all enjoyed. I love you all. Spread the love. And always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.